Hello, and welcome to the lecture from Chapter 8 of OpenStax Astronomy. In this chapter, we're going to talk about Earth, specifically Earth as a planet, and what makes it unique as a planet, and how does it compare to the other planets in the solar system. So, Earth has a few very defining characteristics. We could really say there's a big three, which is going to be its geology, which has a few facets of its own, its magnetic field, and last, but certainly not least, its atmosphere. Now you might be thinking that I'm leaving something out, the fact that Earth is the only known world in the cosmos, which of course we know very little about, that supports life. But we could think that that follows from the big three, the geology, the magnetic field, and the atmosphere of Earth, all being defining characteristics. So what's defining about the geology of Earth? Well, one word sums it up pretty well. It's active. Earth's geology is very active in terms of volcanic eruptions, in terms of spewing gases into outer space, in terms of having a very hot, high-density core and a liquid mantle above the core, in terms of the continents, the ocean, and the lava that flows on the surface of the world, and especially, especially unique geology are the plate tectonics and the continental drift, the movement shown here with arrows between continents. Okay, now let's go back and consider that this geology is unlike other worlds in the solar system. The geology of Earth is not like that of certainly the gas planets, but if more fair comparison to the terrestrial worlds of Mercury, Venus, and Mars, Earth is nothing like them. The most similar world in the solar system is Venus. But even though Venus has volcanic eruptions aplenty, it does not have the plate tectonics that I just showed you a moment ago. There is no planet with a greater level of geological activity in the solar system. The one exception there is the moon of Jupiter, the moon known as Io, one of Jupiter's four large moons, that is more geologically active, but it's just a small moon and it doesn't have these other defining characteristics such as an atmosphere. The gravity is much lower on that particular moon than Earth due to its much smaller size. So Earth is completely unique in terms of its geology, but why does that matter? Why does, why does Earth's geology matter so much? Well, I mentioned this idea that the volcanoes produce lots of gases. That could have been the origin of the atmosphere that protects Earth and creates the so-called blue marble that we all live on, a blue marble that supports life. That's what makes it so, you know, the culmination of all these ideas. And really, when we think the blue marble, what's the, what, what do these three main ideas lead up to? Of course, it's that ability to support life on a planet, within its atmosphere, the blue oceans, the white clouds above. This is a, a harbor in the cosmos. This is a safe haven for life. Okay? Now, an interesting thing about Earth's geology is it comes down to Earth being just the right size, but also just the right density. The density of Earth is greater than the other three terrestrial worlds. So it is a greater density. Common misconception is that mercury is more metallic or you know has a greater density, but that's not actually the case. Earth has a greater density even than mercury, okay? And it's the only one of two of the terrestrial planets that really has a liquid mantle that is maintained in the liquid state due to a very hot inner core and outer core, just called the core. There's still a lot of heat in our inner and outer core. Why would there be less heat on, say, the worlds of Mercury and Mars? Well, the reason is size. Okay, so less heat on Mercury and Mars, less heat within the planet, 
less heat continuing to escape to the surface on those smaller worlds because they're simply smaller. The heat over the last 4 billion years or so has largely already escaped. There's continuous source, continual sources of energy in terms of radioactive decay, but it's not sufficient to keep up with the flux of heat coming out of the surface of these worlds of Mercury and Mars. So these are worlds that have largely cooled. They don't really have any active geology anymore. And Venus does have active geology, but Venus has also some very harsh, unique conditions to Venus due to a very dense atmosphere. I'll mention that again when I talk about Earth's atmosphere, and of course when we talk about Venus in the future chapter. But the relatively large size of Earth combined with its greatest density of the terrestrial worlds in the solar system makes Earth have active geology, okay? Absolutely important in terms of outgassing all those volcanic gases, in terms of creating hot spots and lava flows and all the energy that that releases, but also in terms of the continents and the movement of the continents themselves. Because right on top of all these high density, high temperature, and even liquid layers of the inner planet is the crust upon which we all live and upon which the, uh, the oceans sit. This crust is composed of a few key types of rocks, okay? The composition of the crust is made out of sedimentary, metamorphic, and primitive rocks, okay? Um, oh, also igneous, so four types of rocks, okay? So let's write these types down. Igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, we had metamorphic, and lastly, primitive. These rocks make up everything on the surface of the Earth. Everything we, that's, that the ocean sits on, all the continents are made out of one of these four types of rocks. The rocks that come straight from volcanoes are igneous rocks. That's the mantle rising up to the surface and cooling in the, forms, in the form of lava. Okay, So igneous rocks are very important. All, all the land we can think of is being continually generated by new igneous rocks, rising to the surface in large quantities. Sedimentary rocks are created by erosion processes in the surface of the Earth. Erosion that's made possible by the fact we have an atmosphere, an atmosphere that has cycles of H2O, which create rain, but even the wind itself, and the fact that we have glaciation. All these are so important to the continual production of sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are just rocks that have been broken up that were originally either a previous generation of sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks or metamorphic rocks. These rocks are then broken up and deposited without any significant amount of pressure or heat. They're just laid down on top of each other. Those layers then will remain for millions or hundreds of millions of years and become sedimentary rocks. But it's just a layering process initially driven by erosion, made possible by the atmosphere. Pr metamorphic rocks, on the other hand, are also recycled rocks in the way that sedimentary rocks are, not originally formed from the rising mantle like the igneous rocks, but they're rocks that have been changed by being exposed to, after being cooling as igneous rocks, rocks, being exposed to a subsequent round of very high pressure and temperature. These are rocks that get squeezed in parts of the earth where there's particular high amounts of energy squeezing things together. And that's how metamorphic rocks are formed, a much higher energy process, of course, than sedimentary rocks. The last rarest type of a rock is a primitive rock. These are rocks that have been around since the formation of the planet and have largely escaped any chemical modification due to heating, okay? So these are original rocks, the same type of rocks that we'd find in asteroids because those rocks have never really been changed since they were first formed in the primordial solar system, okay? All right, so those are the four types of rocks that make up the entire surface of the Earth. Now, an interesting thing about the surface of the Earth is that it's protected by this magnetic field, okay? And let's talk about some of the terminology here. We see here a solar wind. Well, this is what we're protected from. The solar wind is a continual flow of largely electrons 
and other charged particles that are produced by the high energy of the sun, and they get pushed out at high velocity, and they just wash over the solar system. Now, the thing is, since they, we have a lot of high energy charged particles, these particles can excite atoms and emit photons and actually cause basically cell damage in lots of cases, in the same way that radiation can cause cell damage. So this is high energy charged particles. If they were completely bombarding the surface of Earth, it'd be hard for life to become very complicated due to random cell variation. Essentially, there'd be too much mutation in the gene pool of all the animals on Earth to, to allow life to evolve as we've seen, as we have seen it do on Earth, as the fossil record suggests. Well, that solar wind is redirected. It's pushed around Earth because of Earth's protective magnetic field. Okay, the edge of the magnetic field is called the magnetosphere. All right, and it's created by the field lines themselves. These are magnetic field lines going in this direction. Okay, so going, going in from one pole to another, the north and south poles of essentially a giant magnet that the Earth is made up of. Okay, it's almost as if there's a giant bar magnet inside the center of Earth, and it's driving magnetic field lines, just like a bar magnet would on a tabletop, but of course on a very large scale. There's particular um, aspects besides just protecting us from the solar wind in the direction of the sun, coming from the direction of the sun. There's something called the Van, Al Van Allen belts, which are where charged particles that make, them, make their way down the field lines at the north and south ends of them. Those charged particles then get trapped in helical patterns in these basically these bands of charged particles that are difficult to pass through in terms of space missions because they're essentially large bands of charged particles around the earth now so that's a little bit about the the key characteristics it's a big big magnet that's protecting us from a bunch of charged particles that otherwise would rain down on the surface because the solar wind does not make it to the surface incidentally the solar wind does make it to the upper atmosphere around the poles which lead to the aurora borealis for example in the northern hemisphere now, there's so much to unpack about this magnetic field because the magnetic field represents a, a bridge of understanding about what makes our planet special, working from the inside, starting with the inner and outer cores, all the way up to the fact that we have a blue marble with an atmosphere. So you can think of the magnetic field as being a tying together concept between the inner planet and living on the surface of the planet. And how is that? Well, the magnetic field is created within the core. So it's created within the core of the planet. And it makes the atmosphere possible. So we can say protects and maintains the atmosphere. Now in a few slides, we're gonna break down the atmosphere in more detail and talk about how just having atmosphere is in itself perfect for life. We have to have a particular type of atmosphere. And we'll get into those details actually at the, at the end, the last few slides. But for now, we, we, it's good to appreciate that we wouldn't have in, any atmosphere, life supporting or otherwise, without the magnetic field, okay? Because otherwise it would just get pushed away from the solar wind, let alone worrying about more mutations occurring on the surface. If, it, if, it was, if we had no magnetic field at all, the solar wind would gradually push away the particles due to collisions between the electrons and the molecules that make up the atmosphere. If our, if our magnetic field suddenly turned off, our atmosphere would, would gradually get dissipated into space, okay, over a few million years. But how is the magnetic field created within the core? It's created because we have a liquid metal core. That metal core creates static electricity. So a bunch of free electrons. Then as the planet spins on its own axis of rotation, as we can see here, right? so we might put a couple of arrows in for the spin of Earth. As Earth spins around that axis of rotation, those that static electricity within the core acts like a spinning wire, but of course in a, on a very large, different ge ge geometry, but very similar idea. So with a large spinning wire, we have ourselves a dynamo. We got ourselves an electric generator because any man-made electric generator involves spinning a coil of wire within a magnetic field or within spinning a electric, excuse me, a current carrying wire, spinning that and that generates a magnetic field. Okay, that's how we generate a magnetic field. And then that magnetic field itself can induce a current in the case of an actual generator, a secondary current. And motors work the opposite way, by the way. But 
Our planet is not acting like a motor. It's just acting like a magnetic field generator, okay? Now, that, that magnetic field itself can trap charges like we see in the Van Allen, Van Allen belt. It's an electromagnetic phenomenon. But the magnetic field itself comes from the static electricity within the core that is being spun in a circular motion. And that also explains the direction of the poles because the poles themselves have to be along the axis of rotation, which they essentially are. Okay, so that's why we have a magnetic field. And then that magnetic field existing, created within the core, protects the planet. From what? The solar wind. I think we're ready to move on. So we'd already talked about the plate tectonics, a very special feature of the crust moving about. What's interesting historically is this man here, Alfred Wegener, proposed the idea of plate tectonics. He proposed it based on fossil evidence in the shape of the continents. It was a compelling idea that ended up to be completely right, but completely correct, scientifically speaking, as far as we know. No, no good theory really contradicts it at all. But he died before his theory was accepted, which might seem tragic, but it's worth noting that he offered a list of evidence to support the existence of plate tectonics, that, that the plates had moved over time, but he never introduced a mechanism. He never um, proposed a mechanism that actually led to the movement. How were these plates moving? He did not understand the liquid mantle was the mechanism. That came later, and once that was explained, the idea of plate tectonics were accepted. Looking a little bit about what can happen between plates, we can have the idea that plates are continually created of, a, or I should say, a particular type of plate is continually created called the oceanic plates. They're the ones that are basically being always renewed and generated from the partially melted zone within the the lower crust and the upper mantle. And that hot liquid rock rises to the surface because hot things rise, same with air, and then it cools and creates new plates that are pushed off in both directions. And that occurs at mid-ocean ridges. That's where new plates are continually made. Those higher density oceanic plates, the ones that are continually made at the rift zones, well, they get pushed under continental plates, which can create large trenches as the plate gets pushed under, can create um, basically a line of volcanoes where the plate gets pushed, melts itself, and rises to the surface. As right, we can see this idea there, an island arch maybe due to a hot spot, and we can have plates rubbing against each other as well, as we can see here at the San Andreas Fault. So lots of ways plates can move relative to each other, all driven from the energy within the mantle. Okay, and then of course that mantle itself is driven by energy within our core, energy we still have left over because we're bigger than a planet like Mars or Mercury. Okay, so mountains on Earth are largely created by when two continental plates crash into each other and sort of ripple and push into each other creating mountains, some of which that have not had much time to erode and still have very, very steep cliffs. Okay, finally, let's look at the atmosphere. Number three, the thing that makes the atmosphere special. After we've bridged from the inner planet, the core, the outer core and the mantle onto the surface and explaining the magnetic field, well, that magnetic field redirecting the, that solar wind, allowing for a protective atmosphere to be ma maintained, allowing for life to not be mutated by the cosmic wind, well, we have an atmosphere today. We have one that is primarily nitrogen, okay? So a very, very high percentage of nitrogen and a significant portion of oxygen. So really our atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen in terms of its main components. Are there other things in the atmosphere? Yes, there absolutely are. There's other components of the atmosphere. There's components such as oxygen in another state called um, ozone. And there is, of course, CO2 and argon and H2O itself, but all of those would be in trace, trace amounts, okay? So the nitrogen is at 78% of the atmosphere, and the oxygen is at 21%, leaving only about 1% for the, the third most common gas in the atmosphere, which is argon, and then everything else is trace amounts. And those trace amounts, as I mentioned, include CO2. They also include H2O, water vapor, of course, and ozone, okay, which is O3. Because notice when we talked about oxygen, 
Oxygen is O2. That's called diatomic oxygen. That's what we think of as terms of oxygen gas. Ozone is a special type of molecule that is less common, but very important in the atmosphere. Okay, so primary, primarily nitrogen and otherwise free oxygen. Okay, free, two E's, excuse me, free oxygen. All right, so was the atmosphere always like that? Absolutely not. The atmosphere has become this way due to the evolution of life. So much of what of the atmosphere we have today is a legacy of successful life forms and the evolution of those, those successful life forms. But before we get onto that and talk about the tree of life, let's take a minute and appreciate this graph that I've been drawing already, already that shows the temperature, okay, as essentially a function of height, all right? Now height's shown on the vertical axis because we visualize it that way, but really we're thinking of temperature here and it's variation with height, all right? So temperature is a function of height. Height goes up in kilometers, so 50 kilometers, that's really kind of the very, very upper atmosphere. You couldn't breathe up there, not, not, um, you know, not with some assistance. You know, we, we live down within the troposphere. A lot of weather occurs between the troposphere and the stratosphere. All right. Outer space is considered to be firmly started by 100 kilometers because the, the, um, the gas of the atmosphere is so low density at 100 kilometers and above that essentially you're in outer space. Okay. The effects of scattering blue light would be gone. Everything around you would look black such as outer space looks, okay? The, the ionosphere is well above 100 kilometers. That's where charged particles can get trapped, all right? And the mesosphere, meso meaning middle, is within the stratosphere and the ionosphere, okay? Meteors burn up in the mesosphere because that's where the atmosphere becomes dense enough for them to heat up and, and melt in for the most part. Obviously, some can make their way to the surface. Now, interesting thing, here's that layer of ozone. It's a particular layer, we could say, at the very upper stratosphere. All right. We'll talk about it again in just a moment. But let's, let's look at these temperature variations. We see on the surface of Earth, the average temperature is around 300 Kelvin. Think of that as room temperature, about 20 degrees Celsius, or about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? The temperature falls as you go up. And that makes sense, because we think of mountains, lower density air, very cold. Higher, eleva higher elevations, they're not able to trap heat. We're further away from the sources of heat, all that reflected energy, all that radiation of infrared coming from room temperature objects, black body radiation, that's, you know, all that's happening down near the surface, okay? So the temperature falls as you go up into the stratosphere. But then notice that the temperature goes up again within the ozone. Why is that? Well, because the ozone is acting as a layer that is absorbing UV, okay? So important because the ozone helps support life in the same way that the magnetic field and the magnetosphere help support life. If it wasn't for the ozone absorbing UV, we'd have even more UV than we have making its way to the surface of the planet. UV is very harmful to life. Think about sunburns on human skin. If we had even higher energy UV, the type that gets absorbed in the ozone, we have worse sunburns, yes, but we also have more chances for mutation over evolutionary history. We have less complex life because it'd be very hard for large organisms to successfully be able to you know, reproduce their you know, offspring that aren't too mutated to survive, okay? So the ozone is so important for keeping the planet in a life-supporting state. We'll talk about where it came from. I mentioned that already in just a moment. Now notice then the temperature falls again. That makes sense because there's not much energy being absorbed because this UV is coming from the sun, right? And the ozone is trapping it. That causes more, more random motion of particles, right? And that's what temperature is. But then notice at the very upper ionosphere, the temperature jumps up again. It actually gets above 300. We're going greater than 300 degrees Kelvin, which is totally counterintuitive because everyone thinks of outer space as being very cold, okay? And in fact, it is. And let me explain two things. First of all, the fact that the temperature rises again is due, due, due to the absorption of X-rays. The very thin gas that exists up in the, up in the ionosphere, well, those molecules collide with X-rays. The X-rays are able to emit a lot of their energy, and that causes the high temperature because temperature is just random motion of particles. The few particles that ex exist in the ionosphere are moving really fast. Well, that means high temperature. High average kinetic energy, meaning high average velocity for a gas, that's high temperature. But you wouldn't feel warm in the ionosphere if you were there because the density of gas is so low. And heat is a combination of fast moving particles and a lot of them. Here in the ionosphere, we have fast moving particles, very high temperature, but very low density, so not a lot of heat, okay? But the spike, the absorption is coming from x-rays that Again, luckily, aren't making their way down to the surface. They're getting absorbed in the, in the 
upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. Okay, because you know we talked about UV being harmful. X rays are even more high energy life. If X rays made it to the surface of Earth, good luck for evolution. It just be wouldn't it wouldn't be a habitat to support life. So continuing with the atmosphere you know, that is created by all this absorption of energy, trapping of energy from the surface, of course, full of H2O in trace amounts, but very important for cloud formation. We have dramatic weather effects. Now, it's interesting to think about this circular weather. It's made possible by the characteristics of our atmosphere, but also by the energy, the differential in energy in between, between slowly heating and cooling water and land that both heats faster and cools faster. All right. And the difference between these, these two substances, always moving energy back and forth from the oceans to the land masses, causing circular motion of, of weather due to the fact that these weather patterns exist on a spinning sphere, which imparts its own directionality to the way that winds blow. And of course, you know, we see that here because storms so often have that circular structure. Now, in the past, the, the climate has changed on Earth. We've gone through a number of climate changes. These are most likely due to variations in our axial tilt. We have a precession around our 24 degree axial tilt, all right, 24 degrees, that's the axis of the planet, all right, tilted along as it's rotating relative to the ecliptic plane. But that 24 degrees, despite having a precession, which is a rotation of the tilted axis about the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the planar axis of the solar system, that, that precession is on the, the level of a few tens of thousands of years. But what's interesting is that the 24 degrees doesn't remain constant. There's a secondary wobble on top of the precession, and that wobble could explain greater ice ages o over the scale of hundreds of thousands, or you know, many tens of thousands of years. And in fact, there was a point in, in you know, um, a few, few 10,000 years ago, we had a series of ice ages um, concluding at about 20,000 years ago was one of the, the last kind of a series of ice ages. During those ice ages, we had, as if we zoom in on here, on, on a world that looks a lot like ours, we see that there is you know, lower sea levels and large glaciation that allowed most you know, famously Alaska to actually touch um, you know, Siberia. And then there was a direct path for the migration of animals, including ancestors to modern humans, okay? So we've definitely had a series of ice ages and then conclusions of ice ages, warmer, warmer eras in the planet that we see. Now, those warm eras that, you know, warming and cooling that we've seen over the last, say, you know, a few hundred thousand years, we could then compare that to the scope of looking back as far back as the dinosaurs at 60 million years, you know, at the conclusion of the era of the, di era of the dinosaurs. And that much larger time frame, what, what would explain the, the planet being so much warmer around the time of the atmosphere or time of the dinosaurs? Well, the answer is a different atmosphere. Because our atmosphere has not always been the same. In fact, we can think of the atmosphere as starting with very early life. This is one of the first organisms that, that's in this, the, um, the fossil record, and that's stromatolites, and that they're a type of essentially algae that grew in, in colonies, almost like a coral, and they left behind the, the, col the colonial growth that the algae did. But you know, early evolution of algae is so important because what early life did some 3 billion years ago is life started to absorb CO2, okay? So these, these algae organisms, very early primordial life, okay? They, they absorb CO2 and then they emitted free oxygen, O2. Some of that free oxygen later on would go on be, to become ozone, okay? But the very fact that these early plants, okay, very early evolutionary plants, absorb CO2 and emitted O2 would later become crucial to organisms like land animals, mammals existing, including humans. And the reason for that is because otherwise our atmosphere would probably primarily be CO2. We see this in the thin atmosphere of Mars. Mars is a very thin atmosphere due to its small size, right? It's cooled. And it's a lack of magnetic field because it's cooled and you need a liquid core to maintain a magnetic field, okay? We don't really see any um, atmosphere at all in Mercury, but in Venus, we also see an atmosphere high in CO2, okay? Earth doesn't just have CO2 in its atmosphere, okay? And Venus's atmosphere, by the way, is very dense, unlike Mars, is very thin, but both, both high in CO2. So why don't we have more CO2? Well, a good guess is that these early, a good hypothesis is these early living organisms absorb CO2 and emit O2. We see them doing it today. Now, why is this so important? Well, because in the evolution of life, the tree of life, right, starting with some blue-green blue algae and very primordial organisms, leading up to, you know, splitting into bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, including, you know, even things like, you know, plants and animals and so on, right? Plants, animals, fungi, all on the same branch of life, okay? Well, 
it all would have been possible because of a, a, that process, a chemical process of absorbing CO2 and emitting O2. Now for about 1 million years, so if, if, you know, if we start at 3 million years, we continue for the 1 million mark, this process was happening, but there wasn't really a buildup of O2 and certainly no O3 yet, ozone. And that's because just as much CO2 as being created by plants like the stromatolites and their relatives was being reabsorbed by the free carbon, okay? But the, plant, the planet continued to change. Processes of greater weather allowed for some of the free carbon of these, this algae to probably get trapped underneath the surface of sediments like sands and then not immediately absorb the oxygen. So over a gradual period, we finally had a buildup, an excess of O2. And then that excess O2, someone was able to fit, become ozone. So at, at about the 2 million mark from, you know, before our current day and about 1 million, 1 million years after life started, we had an atmosphere that really started to get a lot of O2 that started to get up to these modern levels of 21%, a significant portion of the atmosphere. Okay. And that was so crucial because that created the ozone, which allowed for less high energy, you know, photons on the surface, which led for a whole series of terrestrial organisms like the animals, the fungi, and the terrestrial plants to really diversify on land, right? So important to our own heritage, all made possible due to plants that originally absorbed CO2, emitted O2 over hundreds of millions of years until there's finally a buildup, okay? Now, the interesting thing about our planet is it's being protected by the ozone in terms of the UV. So we can think of the Ozone is occurring up here, right? Higher, higher temperature due to the absorption of the UV, so, so important for the particles to make it to the surface. But if we go way down, right, to the, the you know, troposphere, stratosphere, and we consider clouds, well, clouds do their own thing. And they, do, they, they have a phenomenon that depends on how much CO2 they have in them. So the CO2 that is only really trace amounts in our atmosphere has a big effect. And of course, you've probably heard of it because you've heard of it in the context of global warming. It creates a greenhouse effect. Now, the trace amounts of CO2 we have today already create a greenhouse effect. They keep the troposphere warmer than it would be otherwise. But as we emit more and more CO2, we're actually changing in a dramatic way the concentration and likely the way that heat is held in the troposphere, the part of the atmosphere near the surface. Okay? And of course, in some cases, this is in combination of causing disruptions in the ozone because emitting CO2 into the atmosphere in large enough amounts would eventually disrupt the, the, the actual portion of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, currently, the amount of oxygen is, is holding pretty darn close and is not dropping significantly from 21%. But you can only imagine the concern of global warming if our oxygen levels were falling in combinations of CO2 levels rising. But it is important to appreciate that the CO2 is, after all, a lot less than 1%. Okay? Excuse me, a lot less than 1%. So it's, you know, it's a tiny trace amount of the actual composition of molecules in the atmosphere. But it makes a big effect because of that way to reflect energy back down to the surface, okay? Kind of trapping infrared heat. All right. And the last thing of this lecture, this rather long lecture talking all about Earth, is the fact that we're not completely protected from outer space. Sure, we are protected by, from x-rays and, and um, UV in the case of uh, our, our atmospheric composition. We're protected from the um, cosmic wind and all the free electrons due to our magnetosphere, but sometimes we're not protected from asteroid collisions. And certainly we have large cases of asteroids or comets crashing into the surface of Earth, causing huge destruction and perhaps even a huge evolutionary event where the era of the dinosaurs ended due to dramatic climate change due to a particularly large impact. And that concludes our look at Earth as a planet. I hope this lecture has been both interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.